Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm delighted to have you all here. I'm Liz Cohen. I'm Dean at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome Huda Zarek, Pre 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 Professor of Epidemiology and Population Health at the American University in Beirut as this year's Rama S. Mehta Lecturer. As an institute for advanced study, the Radcliffe Institute seeks to reach beyond the gates of Harvard to develop new relationships with scholars and activists around the world and to share the knowledge they are generating with new audiences. The Rama Mehta Lecture offers us a wonderful opportunity to do just that. Professor John Kenneth Galbraith and his wife Catherine, along with the Mehta family, established the Mehta Lecture to bring to Radcliffe outstanding women leaders with a deep understanding of the challenges women face in the developing world. Today's lecture has also been made possible by the generous support of Lila Fawaz, the Issam M. Farris Professor of Lebanese and Eastern Mediterranean Studies at Tufts University and a great friend of the Radcliffe Institute. The Galbraiths initiated this lecture in memory of their friend and their colleague, Rama Mehta, whose work as a scholar of modern Indian family and social life grappled with the interplay of tradition and modernity in India. She explored a range of topics, including women's education, divorce, purda, and the ways that Indian families responded to population growth. During the 1960s, she was a fellow at Radcliffe's Bunting Institute. It's also a great honor today to welcome uh, her son, Uday Mehta, who is in our audience, uh, to honor his mother and enjoy the legacy of her life here at Radcliffe. Just as Rama Mehta's work on women's experiences benefited from her vantage point inside Indian culture, Professor Zarek's research on health in the Middle East is shaped by her own deep love for her native region and her nuanced understanding of its complexities. Professor Zarek has devoted herself to improving the health of people in the Arab world, particularly women and children, often in the face of political, economic, and social insecurity. Her career has focused both on conducting groundbreaking collaborative public health research and on building institutions such as NGOs devoted to improving public health in the Middle East. Born in Lebanon, Professor Zarek studied at the American University of Beirut, and in case you don't know, AUB is one of the leading institutions of higher education in the Middle East. And then she came on to pursue graduate work at Harvard and at Johns Hopkins. Professor Zarek returned to teach at AUB, uh, the American University of Beirut, in the 1970s and 80s, where her early research focused on fertility and maternal child health in Lebanon. In the late 1980s, she began to split her time between teaching at AUB and working with the Population Council's regional office for West Asia and North Africa in Cairo. Professor Zarek returned to AUB in the late 1990s to serve as Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, helping to build its graduate program and to mentor young faculty. As a senior associate at the Population Council in Cairo, Professor Zarek helped found the Reproductive Health Working Group in 1988. The group spearheaded culturally sensitive research on women's health with the aim of developing better healthcare services and healthcare policy across the region. It was through the Reproductive Health Working Group that Professor Zarek conducted a series of studies on women's reproductive health in Giza, Egypt, well known as the Giza Study. The Giza study used a unique research protocol to gather new data. First, it combined medical and anthropological approaches to women's health. Second, it gave as much weight to women's perceptions of their own health and illness as it did to biomedical measures. The study also took a broader view of women's reproductive health than was common at the time. Rather than focus on family planning and pregnancy alone, the Giza study examined the frequency of reproductive diseases and disorders among poor women in two rural villages. The findings were striking. 
Most women suffered from reproductive illnesses that went unnoticed and untreated throughout their lives. Professor Zurek and her colleagues also demonstrated how cultural standards influence health. Women were unlikely to seek health services because they frequently lacked medical understanding of their own bodies and because husbands often determined whether or not their wives could receive treatment. In response, a pilot study conducted with the Egyptian Ministry of Health and Population demonstrated how reproductive health care services could be integrated successfully into primary health clinics. By serving as a model for further studies of reproductive health throughout the developing world, the Giza study played a key role in changing attitudes towards population policy. When the 1994 UN International Conference on Population and Development drew on the findings of the Giza study to establish the Cairo Agenda, it combined population and development strategies for the first time. As a result of Professor Zurek's work, reproductive choice, health, and dignity, including the right to reproductive health care throughout the primary health care system, were recognized as fundamental human rights. Professor Zurek's accomplishments would be remarkable under any conditions, but they are all the more so because they have been undertaken in a region that has endured protracted dislocation and instability, such as most recently the refugee crisis sparked by the Syrian conflict. She is widely respected for her wise counsel and her collaborative spirit, and consults frequently with the UN and other NGOs in the region, as well as with colleagues around the globe. And I know this firsthand, because whenever I mention to colleagues locally in the public health field that Huda Zarek was coming to speak at Radcliffe this spring, I heard only the highest praise and respect for her and for her work. Professor Zarek, we are honored that you would travel such a great distance to share with us your answers to the question you posed in your provocative title of your talk, What Tomorrow? A Day in the Life of an Arab Woman. So thank you for coming, and I look forward to your talk, as I'm sure the audience does as well. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to this lecture. I thank the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University for inviting me to give the Rama Mehta Lecture for 2014. I am particularly honored to be speaking on an annual occasion dedicated to Rama Mehta, an Indian scholar of great talent, a sociologist, a diplomat, and an accomplished novelist. I didn't have a chance to read her novels because I couldn't get my hands on her books, but maybe here I can find them. I am happy uh, to be at the Radcliffe Institute today, today and to be addressing this amazing audience. I thank Dean Elizabeth Cohen for her generous introduction and welcome. In my lecture today, What Tomorrow? A Day in the Life of an Arab Woman, I will follow the outline shown on the first slide. First, I will start with a personal retrospective describing my formative years in Lebanon to draw an image of what was possible for some women to achieve in the years following independence in 1943, years that were full of hope and pregnant with opportunities. I will, second, I will second move to a more general level uh, to show the progress of women in the Arab countries uh, that women in the Arab countries have achieved with time on basic indicators of human development, such as education, labor force participation, family formation, and health. Where are Arab women today on these indicators? I will next review the historical, social, and economic context of Arab women's lives and the constraints which influence the full realization of women's potential despite progress on basic indicators. Fourthly, I will single out debilitating effects of conflict and war which are spreading in the Arab region and increasing the instability 
insecurity and uncertainty of Arab women's lives. Finally, I will conclude with reflections on what needs to be done to support a real transformation of women's and men's life conditions in order to bring equality, justice, and well-being to women's tomorrow. First, my, my formative year, a personal retrospective. I was born in Beirut in 1943, the year Lebanon became independent following 20 years of Fran French mandate over Syria and Lebanon. The times were hopeful, and they reflected positively on my childhood and youth, except for the tragic loss of Palestine in 1948 when I, when I was five years old. My mother, Najla, pursued her education and work until she got married at the age of 28. After completing high school at the American School for Girls in Beirut, she was told by her father that he had two sons to educate through university and could not afford to cover her studies too. But she managed to work and to pay for her studies until she graduated with a BA degree from the Department of Sociology at AUB in 1937. Yet my mother chose not to work following marriage and willingly devoted her life to her family. My father, Constantine, was professor of history at the American University of Beirut, having obtained his BA from AUB in 1928, his MA from the University of Chicago in 1929, and his PhD from Princeton University in 1930, specializing in Arab history. His most influential writings were on Arab nationalism, on the Arab condition in the present and the future, and on the Palestine Nakba, meaning disaster. The title of one of his books, written in Arabic in 1957, Ayu translates in English as which tomorrow, a question he was asking about the Arab world at the time. I have used a variant of his title in this Rama Mehta lecture based on observations and research experiences to ask what tomorrow for Arab women. My parents had four girls and I am the second born. We all studied at Ahliya School for Girls, a national, secular, private girls school in contrast to foreign-run and religious schools that abounded at the time. The principal of the school believed in women's potential and she encouraged students at Ahliya to be independent, responsible, and productive. I made many lasting friendships while in this school with girls of all classes and religious sects studying together in harmony and enjoyment. That was the Lebanon we knew at the time. The next natural step for me was to enroll at the American University of Beirut, or AUB, where my father was a faculty member and had, benefit, and had the benefit of free education for his children. This step was not so natural for several of my friends at Ahliya. Some had to convince their conservative parents to allow them to pursue university education. Some had parents who could not afford the costs of AUB, and some did not gain admission to AUB. AUB was established by American Protestant missionaries in 1866 as the Syrian Protestant College. A lot has been written about the history and impact of AUB in the region. It opened up opportunities for generations of students to achieve quality education in a variety of majors, including arts, humanities, and sciences, as well as the professions. Above all, it provided a liberal education emphasizing critical thinking and creativity, and it offered space for debate and for self-expression. I graduated from AUB with a BA in statistics in June 1965. As uh, Dean Cohen has said, 
I applied for graduate study in the US and was accepted and awarded a scholarship by Harvard University to study mathematical statistics starting in the fall of 1965. I graduated with an MA in mathematical statistics in June 1966. It was a wonderful year I spent in the women's dorm in 6 Ash Street and met women, met women of all nationalities and learned about the world. I studied with Fred Mosteller, Arthur Dempster, and William Cochran and others, and I don't know if you know them, but I still remember them very well, and was rigorously trained in my field. I did well, yet at the end of the year, I was ready to return home, for I came to realize that mathematical statistics was very abstract, and far from the reality of people's lives in Lebanon and the region, uh, lives and realities that I was keen to understand and I hope to contribute to improving. Returning to Lebanon, I was approached to join the School of Public Health at AUB, which was, which was in need of a statistician. There I discovered the people and community-centered field of public health and it became my passion. Shortly thereafter, I succeeded to obtain a Population Council scholarship to continue my PhD studies at the School of Hygiene and Public Health, as it was then called, at the Johns Hopkins University, to study for a PhD in biostatistics with an emphasis on population studies. I graduated from Hopkins in 1974 and returned to Lebanon rejoining AUB as assistant professor of biostatistics in the School of Public Health. I was full of hope and energy at the time, but then the civil war started in Lebanon in 1975, one year following my return from Hopkins. I began my research journey to the sounds of bullets and mortars, trying hard to stay alive and be productive which were challenges of great proportions. Even though the civil war ended in 1990, life in Lebanon had been transformed. Violence continues at lower intensity and in different forms until today. We have gradually become resilient, and yet we suffer from uncertainty, political instability, and persistent weak government. I move to the, my second session to speak about women's lives, Arab women's lives in general. From this story of an Arab woman who now stands before you, who is in no way typical, but not unusual, I move to a more general level to tell the story of progress of Arab women in the formative years of their countries since independence. I will tell this story through reviewing a few basic indicators of human development uh, in the past and as recently as published statistics allow. I will not present results for all 22 Arab countries, but have selected four countries as follows. The Sudan to represent low-income countries, Egypt and Lebanon to represent medium-income countries, and Saudi Arabia to represent high-income countries as categorized by the World Bank. So what do the indicators of human development tell us about education, work, and family formation patterns of women in the Arab world? Table one, and I hope you can all see, table one shows literacy for population 15 plus in two time periods for the four selected countries. We can see that rates of change with time, particularly for women, are high for most countries. If we look at Sudan, we move from 14% literate in 1990 to 63% literate in 2011. Egypt also from 31 for the females literate to 65. Yet if we focus on latest figures, it is also clear that men have attained higher levels of literacy than women everywhere, and that women in high and middle income countries have attained higher levels of literacy than women in low income countries like Sudan. So if we look at the 
at the blue part, the dark blue part, uh, we find that for Lebanon and Saudi Arabia, 86% of uh, women are literate at the, at the basic, at the latest uh, year, and Saudi Arabia, 82%. Uh, but for Sudan and Egypt, we still have a large number of illiterate women. These populous countries continues to have large numbers of illiterate adult women. Considering next school enrollment for children and youth to examine future potentials, we find that, not, that current level of school enrollment in primary education is almost 100% for boys and girls in all Arab countries, except for Yemen, where it reaches 87% for girls. So I'm not going to show because all the Arab countries report 100% enrollment in primary education. Uh, when we go to secondary school, we find that current level of school enrollment in secondary education is reported at about 90% uh, and over for girls and boys in all Arab countries, except for the countries that I'm going to show in table two. We see in table two uh, that uh, uh, school enrollment in secondary education for Lebanon, uh, for Yemen, is very, very low, particularly for females, but also for males. 22% uh, of, uh, of females at secondary school age are in schools, and 31% for males. Iraq is also problematic. Iraq used to have very good enrollment ratios, but currently 34% of girls at secondary school age are out of uh, uh, secondary schools. Syria also, and this is in 2009, before the problems, um, has not a full uh, enrollment of women, uh, uh, females in secondary school. And Palestine also uh, has 76% of females in secondary school. Now, it is, it is particularly worrisome to look at Iraq, where most girls and boys of secondary school age are now out of secondary schools, and also Yemen, which shows even worse secondary school enrollment levels. Uh, the conditions in Syria nowadays suggest worsening school enrollment in primary and secondary levels, what are the life choices awaiting these young people when they grow up? Despite these setbacks, an ILO report of 2011 considers that the Arab region has achieved faster gains on education compared to other regions of the world. I cannot emph emphasize enough how important education in schools and universities is for women, of course, everywhere. It may be hugely transformational for women receiving good quality and empowering education. This is the kind of transformational education I experienced at Ahliya School and at the American University of Beirut. Unfortunately, transformational education is happening mostly in private schools, creating wide differentials in outlooks and skills among women of different social classes in Arab countries. But what about labor force participation for women, which is known together with education to strengthen women's independence and their ability to control their lives? Table three presents the labor force participation of men and women of age 15 plus in 1990 and then in 2010 in the four selected Arab countries. It reveals that labor force participation for women is much lower than for men. In 2010, the labor force participation rate for women ranged from 20% in Saudi Arabia to 25% in Lebanon and Egypt, and to about one-third in Sudan, which is an agricultural country. These are low levels. Although education rates are rising for females, Weak development efforts and societal constraints have failed in opening and supporting work opportunities for women in Arab countries. I will comment briefly next on family formation pa patterns in Arab countries show shown in tables four and five. 
Table 4 reveals that women in countries like Lebanon and Saudi Arabia are delaying their marriage with 26% in Lebanon and 39% in Saudi Arabia in the age group 20 to 24 being already married. Although we still see some percentages getting married at age less than 15 and some percentages uh, getting mar and married at age 20 to 24, we see, for instance, that in Lebanon and Saudi Arabia, we have a very low percent currently uh, of women marrying at age 15 to 19. This is not so for Sudan, where 20 percent of the age group 50 to 19 are married, and in Egypt, 12 percent. If we look to age 20 to 24, we find that in Lebanon, 26 percent, only one-fifth of the one-fourth of that group is married, and Saudi Arabia 40 percent, and if we compare, Saudi Arabia was 58 percent. But in Sudan and Egypt, we find that uh, the rate of uh, uh, women aged 20 to 24 uh, married in that age group are uh, 50 and 52 percent. So a majority uh, are married by age 20 to 24. I'm sorry, I'm a statistician, and I have to start by putting down the numbers. Okay, uh, if we look at fertility, uh, we show that fertility is dropping in all selected countries. The level reached for the total fertility rate in 2005-2010, this is the, uh, the, uh, the range in which the uh, uh, indicators are shown, are almost five for Sudan. So every woman on the average has five children, is still very high level. 2.9 for Egypt and three for Saudi Arabia, still considered high, and 1.9 for Lebanon, which is at the replacement level. These data show that marriage and childbearing still occupy a large component of the lives of many Arab women with implications for women's roles in society. The issue of harmonizing the sometimes conflicting effects of education, work, and family formation on lives of women deserves more research at attention and societal debate all over the world. It is important for states to consider socializing the role of childcare, which is borne by women, and doing that in at least two ways. One, the state would bear the cost of a year-long maternity leave for mothers covered under for the formal social security system. And two, the state also establishes or requires the development of training centers and refresher courses to help women to return to work, especially after a long absence from working life. These are recommendations of the ILO. I move next to speak about health and health indicators in the Arab world. Now, uh, uh, the indicators of health uh, uh, largely focus on mortality rates and do not give due attention to prevalence and type of ill health which should be included in representation, representations of women's health. So when we look at the health indicators, they're mostly looking at mortality. And I will show two health indicators, okay? The one which is most used and which is the uh, expectation of life at birth. Uh, the, the expectation of life of females is shown to have increased over the years in all selected countries. Most recently, it reached 74 years for Egypt, Lebanon, and Saudi Arabia where it is only, while it is only 62 years for Sudan. It is important to note that this indicator, although it speaks about expectation of life and living, uh, builds on the rates by age at which women are dying. So this day, these figures are obtained by looking at the rates at which women are dying. The increasing level of expectation of life at birth for females indicates that mortality is declining in these selected Arabic, Arab countries, reflecting a positive health outcome for women. 
Table 7 presents the trends in maternal mortality ratio, the MMR, which is the key Millennium Development Goal indicator selected to monitor women's health. It shows the number of maternal deaths occurring per 100,000 live births. The MMR has decreased in all selected Arab countries between 1990 and 2010, and it currently varies from about 24 to 25 in Lebanon and Saudi Arabia, to 66 in Egypt, and to 730 in Sudan, 730 maternal deaths per 100 live births. This value for Sudan is extremely high given that most causes of a maternal death are preventable at present. These two indicators show progress in health outcomes for women in selected current uh, countries not sufficient for Sudan, but they only inform us about mortality rates, the rates at which women are dying. To understand women's health, we need more information first about the causes of death. We also need to go beyond mortality and examine what type of ill health is prevalent among women and what brings it about. So let us look at some measures that include ill health. The DALIs, which are disability adjusted life years, and I won't go into explaining this, the DALI analysis rank diseases according to their prevalence in causing death or ill health, weighted by the extent of disability uh, this cause brings. So we take account of the prevalence and we take account of the seriousness of uh, ill health uh, from these causes. Recently, the Global Burden of Disease Study GBD 2010 provided all regions of the world with information on disease burden measured through the concept of DALIs. The GBT report focuses on the top 10 to 15 causes of DALIs, that is of mortality and morbidity, shown nationally, regionally, and globally. I will not uh, discuss this methodology, its advantages and limitations, but I will move to showing what are the top causes of DALIs in the MENA region? It wasn't available for the Arab countries. They were, the way they grouped the countries together was Middle East and North Africa, uh, which uh, uh, exclude some of the least developed countries and include Iran uh, and Turkey. Uh, uh, here, here, women are divided by, uh, by age, and we look at the uh, causes of mortality and, mor and morbidity for women. For instance, we learn that for women 15 to 49 years of age, major depressive disorders, low back pain, and anxiety disorders now rank first, second, and third as causes of DALIs. We don't see a lot of maternal causes or nutritional causes or communicable diseases. Uh, this is uh, for uh, women in the whole MENA region. And as I said, it, it, it excludes some of the least developed countries, like Sudan and other countries. So uh, for the MENA region, for women in the reproductive age group, it's mainly major dep depressive disorders, low back pain, anxiety disorders, Etc. For older ages, the profile changes with non communicable diseases being the most important. Mental health has thus become a first concern for women in the reproductive age in the region. This is understandable given the difficult socioeconomic and conflict situations we are living through. From this reality, it becomes important not to adopt a purely biomedical perspective in, 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 in interpreting the prominence of mental disorders in representations of women's health. The, my, the biomedical perspective pathologizes mental health problems and does not give due attention to the contribution of the social context in bringing on psychological manifestations. It leads to treatment modalities which require women to take medications 
and avoids addressing the more difficult social and conflict conditions that are at the root of mental health problems. Having reviewed representations of health in terms of measures of mortality and measures inclu including ill health, my intention now is to ask two critical questions regarding representation of women's health. One, whose perspective should we be taking into account? And two, how broadly can we express women's health in terms of well-being rather than mortality and morbidity? I would like to address the first, question, uh, the, the first question on whose perspective should we take into account in representing women's ill health through recounting the experience of the Giza morbidity study that I was involved in when I was working with the Population Council in Egypt. And uh, Dean Cohen uh, alluded to the study. Uh, it, it has been a very important and significant uh, uh, study uh, and had uh, repercussions on or implications for me and my growth as a researcher. The Giza morbidity study explores different perspectives of the meaning of ill health among poor Egyptian women. The evidence I will provide goes back for more than 20 years, but the lessons learned and the questions raised remain relevant to representations of women's health today. The Giza morbidity study was le led by three researchers, an anthropologist, a gynecologist, and myself as a statistician. We carefully selected two villages in rural Giza on the outskirts of Cairo city to conduct the study. Uh, as uh, Dean Cohen said, the study was meant to reveal the prevalence of gynecological conditions for women in these villages through inviting them to take a medical exam at the village health center. The, the study also intended to ask women about their experience of symptoms of gynecological conditions through a questionnaire implemented in their homes before undertaking the medical exam. It is hard to summarize the findings of the Giza morbidity study. It is also hard to explain its lasting impact on my formation as a researcher, as well as for those involved in the study. It was my first experience of a truly interdisciplinary study. In terms of the biomedical perspective, the medical exam revealed that women, we had a sample of 528, have a multitude of gynecological conditions, including, as uh, Dean Cohen said, reproductive tract infections. 51% of the women suffered from reproductive tract infections. Genital prolapse, 56%, with 29% having severe prolapse. Suspicious cell changes, 11%, and also urinary tract infections, obesity, and anemia. From the women's perspective, on being asked about their experience of discharge, many women described quantity, color, smell, and consistency of discharge that could be indicative of an RTI. Yet women expressed that this discharge was normal to their nature as women, given that most women in the community are or have experienced this kind of discharge, all the symptoms they reported they saw as women's lot in life, and they did not recognize them as indicative of ill health or as being treatable. They suffered in silence. From a primary healthcare system perspective, a health center was available in each of the two villages headed by a female physician who also ran a reproductive health clinic. Yet the physician was not aware of or not concerned with the extent of prevalence of gynecological and related uh, conditions in her community. She was only required to report on how many women visited her reproductive health clinic, particularly for maternal health and family planning, which were governmental priorities. 
The information on gynecological conditions was provided through the Giza morbidity study, which is a special and very expensive study. So it is clear that we need a multi-perspective reporting to understand the condition of women's ill health. It's not enough and it's very expensive to do a medical exam, uh, but the women are not, uh, sometimes are not aware. So we have to understand how the women look at their own ill health. I must emphasize here that I am referring to women's actual voices and not to the international women's health agenda that assumes the voices of women. It's very important to listen to the women themselves. It has been very educative to hear them talk about their health. In terms of the second question as to how we can develop broader representations of women's well-being, so we don't focus on the physical mortality and morbidity, I want to emphasize again how important it is to listen to and report on women's qualitative descriptions of their health problems. To illustrate, I will tell another story from the Giza morbidity study. I have many stories from other studies because I have learned to listen to women, or, uh, but I, I find this one particularly uh, illustrative. My story has to do with when we presented our detailed results of the Giza study to mixed audiences in Egypt, physicians were very worried about the prevalence of RTIs among women in these three villages. They felt that these conditions could threaten women's health and even life and their fertility. The physician's response to the prevalence of prolapse was different, however, since they considered prolapse a condition that can be corrected only through surgery, which is too expensive for these women. They felt the women are to be blamed for this prolapse condition because of having too many deliveries and with unskilled providers. Women, on the other hand, felt that prolapse could be a very serious condition for the pain and discomfort it brings. One woman, diagnosed by the medical exam to have a prolapsed vagina and uterus, informed us that when her husband returns from Libya, where he is working, and they have sex frequently, she feels every time a pain that starts in her feet and mounts all the way to the top of her hand, head and almost strangles her. It was very hard for her to endure this pain and yet she could not refuse to have sex with her husband, which was considered a duty of a loving wife. Because it does not kill, physicians seem to push aside this condition without considering women's suffering or women's well-being. This woman was able to express how negatively prolapse affected her well-being. A second recommended representation of women's health that approaches the concept of well-being is quality of life as developed by WHO. This is a measure that has been used in the region, particularly in the occupied Palestinian territories, uh, through successful applications of the adapted uh, WHO qual breath questionnaire, for any one of you who knows about it, and it investigates the following domains. It investigates physical health, psychological health, social relationships, and the environment. Through this instrument, the Institute of Community and Public Health of Birzeit University has been able to represent the multidimensional effect of the Israeli occupation on well-being of individuals in the OPT. Their studies have suggested the addition of a political domain this instrument can be applied more broadly to represent women's well-being in Arab countries. I have spent some time on looking on health representation because if we want to understand women's problems, it is not sufficient to look at the data that is currently given to us, which is mortality and morbidity. We have to go beyond them as we have to do in education because in education we know how many are going to school, but what kind of education are they getting and how empowering is it? 
Now, I move to the third section, which is the context of women's lives, uh, particularly patriarchy, considering patriarchy, colonialism, and political economy. The transformative potential of basic qualities that women acquire in the process of development cannot be properly understood without considering the context of women's lives in the historical, social, economic, and cultural factors where uh, these factors interact. In the Arab world, we must first recognize the influence of traditional patriarchy, which has been historically rooted in our societies. It is manifested first and foremost in male power and dominance, leading to some preference to imposing restrictive codes of behavior on women and to associating family honor with female chastity. Some of these elements of traditional patriarchy have been codified in Islamic law or Sharia. The principles of Sharia, which have for long been subject to conservative interpretations in our region, have required male guardianship over women and have give, given women subordinate positions, particularly in matters of marriage and inheritance. Recently in Saudi Arabia, activist women wrote an open letter to the King's Consultative Council, Majlis al-Shura, on the occasion of the International Day for Women, demanding limitation of the absolute guardianship of men, father, brother, husband, son, over women. They asked for abolishment of the requirement for approval of the guardian in numerous matters, such as education, work, mobility, and medical care, as well as in issuing an identity card or passport and in signing contracts with government and private enterprises. We acknowledge that Saudi Arabia is an extreme case, yet the notion of patriarchy has influenced how Arab societies look at women and how Arab women look at themselves. We must also recognize, second, the colonial experiences of most Arab countries in the early 20th century, during which legal and governance structures were set in place. It is generally believed that these colonial experiences were concerned with ending patriarchy, particularly the, the French colonization of North Africa and its colonial mandate or over Lebanon and Syria, as well as British colonial mandate over Iraq, Jordan, and Palestine. Yet the feminist sociologist Fatima Mernisi, in writing about Morocco, argues that France actually exported its own miso misogyny into legislation. Feminists agree that this same process occurred also in other Arab countries, where part of the legal systems established under colonialism address family laws and inheritance laws in a way that is discriminatory for women. These components were based on a conservative interpretation of Sharia, and there was no effort from colonial administrations to negotiate on the side of more liberal interpretations of Sharia that were surfacing at the time. In addition, nationality laws not actually addressed by Sharia were developed in many Arab countries during the colonial period. These laws did not give women married to foreigners the right to transmit their nationality to their children, a right given to men in similar situations. These discriminatory laws persist to date in some countries such as Lebanon and are given untenable justifications on the political front. In the past decades, women advocates and NGOs took up the struggle to reform family laws in Arab countries that discriminate against women. These movements have made gains in several Arab countries and particularly in Tunis, very early on from the days of Bourguiba, Morocco, Egypt, Jordan, and Palestine to different degrees. 
The case of Morocco is particularly significant where, in response to persistent advocacy and negotiation by women's groups, uh, the Mudawwana, or family law, was reformed in 2004. The reforms made husbands and wives jointly responsible for the family, this is in 2004, recognized that adult women are entitled to self-guardianship, specified the minimum legal age of marriage at 18 for both men and women, and gave the right to divorce also to women. Family laws, uh, oh. women's groups in Arab countries are also campaigning for the nationality rights of women married to foreigners, for the criminalization of domestic violence, and now there is a very big campaign in Lebanon that is moving in a very strategic way, and pro for providing opportunities and support for women's greater economic and political participation. On the political front, some Arab countries like Egypt and Jordan have responded to demands for more opportunities for women's political participation by adopting a quota system for appointment of women in the upper house. Women are also running for election to parliament and to municipality councils in various Arab countries with some success. Yet in all Arab countries, men still largely dominate the political sphere and particularly at the leadership level, which to my mind is one of the contributory factor, factors to the maintenance of conflict and stagnation in these countries. As for the economy, we have seen that the participation of women remains low. This is in large part due to the significant influence of the Western-driven globalized economic system based on the ideology of neoliberalism and the dominance of market economies. This global economic system has forced unbalanced privatization and the end of the welfare state. It has also forced Arab countries to comp and, and, and countries generally of the developing world to compete unequally on the world market Leading, leading to worsening economic conditions and to expanding poverty levels. Work migration to the rich Gulf countries and Saudi Arabia has helped stabilize failing economies in Arab countries. However, the political instability in the region and the persisting conflicts have caused further deterioration of economic conditions. In such a context, women's work is marginalized because of limited work opportunities and low levels of pay, most women continue to work within the household with, with no recognition of their economic contribution and without being able to contribute to family income and to generate an independent income for themselves. I will speak fourthly on the context of war. We come now to the context of occupation and of war, which are long-standing features of the occupied Palestinian territory, and also more recently in Lebanon. In addition, the promising movements for change that occurred recently in many Arab countries against despotic rulers have brought to these countries experiences of chronic conflict and war. These, these are difficult situations to face and to endure. I am reminded of my feeling in the 60s and early 70s when the war in Vietnam was raging. Uh, uh, and I asked myself every morning as I read the newspapers, how can people survive under these conditions? Now I know firsthand what hardship is involved in survival particularly for poor women taking care of their families in the many conflict situations of Arab countries. I grew up in an environment very sensitive to the injustice done to Palestinians and Arabs following their defeat in 1948, which led to the establishment of the State of Israel on part of Palestinian land. The event is more than 65 years old, 
and the injustice has grown with time, multiplying suffering and instability for Palestinians, those who stayed and those who sought refuge in neighboring Arab countries or elsewhere. The feeling of injustice are internalized in the Arab persona and engender pain and frustration that are deeply felt. Lebanon has also suffered from years of civil war, from attacks and occupations by Israel, and most recently from the consequences of the civil war in Syria. One of the consequences of this war has recently been a series of car explosions that have targeted specific areas in and outside Beirut, killing and injuring innocent bystanders. These explosions can happen anywhere, anytime, and they threaten and frighten people all over Lebanon. This situation of conflict and instability is coming to encompass a large number of Arab countries today with the transformations of the Arab Spring upheavals into armed and civil conflicts in Bahrain, Egypt, Libya, Tunis, and Yemen, and most seriously in Syria. It is not possible to forget Iraq, which fragmented after the US invasion of the country in 2003 and has transformed into a war and conflict-torn society with killings continuing to happen every day. In all these countries, and particularly in Syria and Iraq, armed radical Islamist groups have emerged and are espousing extremely conservative ideologies and are adopting terrorizing behaviors that threaten the path of development and democracy in the Arab world. It's not possible to fathom the impact of these chronic conflict situations and wars on the lives of people, particularly as images projected by local and international media tend to focus on scenes of destruction and death, which are devastating, but never tell the whole story. The story we, have to ima we must imagine here is that of families living in uncertainty and fear and not knowing what their tomorrow will be. Some are displaced to safe areas and some remain in their houses hoping that the fighting will not reach them. They, summer, they suffer from not having enough food, from cuts in water supply and electricity, and from weakened and fragmented health services. They struggle to stay alive and well under very harsh conditions. Over a million and a quarter Syrians and Palestinian refugees have been displaced into Lebanon by, uh, uh, to date by the fighting in Syria. One million and a quarter, while the population of Lebanon is a little over four million. So this is very large numbers. The displaced live in four areas of Lebanon, crowded in rented, many times debilitated housing, each family to a room. If they are classified as vulnerable families, they receive from UNHCR cash payments equivalent to $35 per member each month. Otherwise, men and women have to work mostly as informal labor in agriculture and domestic work to earn wages that can barely support their large families. By working, they compete with Lebanese workers and accept lower pay, which generates an animosity from the host community. They crowd and struggle in registration lines and in distribution lines for mattresses, blankets, clothes, and other items. They suffer humiliating experiences for a largely peasant people who used to live on and work their own lands and who value their dignity. From dignity comes resilience, and they are strong, having had a life of hard work and outdoor living. Yet uprooting has shaken these proud people. Children experience trauma which lead to developmental problems. Women suffer from depression and anxiety, and men constrain their misery, but domestic violence increases. Basic and mental health services are provided by the Lebanese government health centers and by NGOs. If a serious chronic illness develops, 
However, there is no one to help and families have to fend for their own. These are families who lived in Syria and they used to benefit from the Syrian uh, health system that provides free medications and free services uh, for, uh, uh, for Syrians. Now, uh, in their displacement, uh, uh, they don't find any solution or any help in uh, managing and treating chronic illnesses. Women continue to get pregnant for that categorizes their family as vulnerable and qualifies them for food assistance and sometimes better housing. In fact, I, I really would like to understand better why Syrian refugee women are still getting pregnant and at very, uh, 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 very prevalent in these displacement centers. Uh, one of the field workers, to, and I have uh, quoted her, told me that this is the case they see. But uh, I, w I would like, and we are trying to plan for a study that would look at why in the, in the, in the face of this misery, people continue to want to have children. Women continue to get pregnant for that categorizes their families as vulnerable and qualifies them for food assistance and sometimes better housing. They can only think of day-to-day -day survival and do not see the needs a newborn will place on the family, particularly in the future. The only thing on their mind is what tomorrow and how the family can make it for one more day. These are conditions that many Arab women and families living in poverty and conflict conditions are experiencing today. Yet even women like me, who enjoy privileged conditions and can afford to create comfort, comfort conditions for themselves, are not always sure what awaits tomorrow and cannot take a longer term view into an unknown future. Because of this uncertainty and of dangers that prevail in situations of conflict and war, many individuals and families, particularly families with young children, have chosen to migrate outside the region, many of them to the US, as some of you have done who are present here today. I believe that for many of you, leaving has not been easy. I, for one, never wanted to leave, and that was made possible and easier to implement since I do not have children. I will remain in Lebanon and the region because of three main reasons. The rootedness I feel and the sense of belonging to beautiful Lebanon and to the region. Two, the good that I have done, particularly as Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, and that I continue to do at AUB and beyond. And three, the moments of pleasure I have with family and friends, despite the many frustrations and dangers of everyday living. This is my grandfather's house in Brumana, the village where he, they come, he comes from and it reflects the rootedness that I feel in this country where we have been living for generations. And I do not see and I hope that I do not have to leave. What should be done and whose responsibility is it? In my lecture today, I have tried to show how uncertainty and instability due to the ongoing conflict and war in the region add to the burdens of Arab women, particularly in poor settings, as they care for their families and themselves. I will end by reflecting on what I think should be done and who can make it happen. I believe that three actions are absolutely necessary. The first, to work for more women in leadership positions. The Arab world has been failed by its male leaders who forget that their power should be used for their people's benefit and not their own. I believe that having more visionary women leaders in government and politics will make a difference, especially if they remain sensitive to ordinary people's needs. 
I'm very happy to mention here that last week, or maybe a little more, in elections of party leadership for the Destour, which is the Constitution Party of Egypt, an educated Christian woman was selected to be partly party president. I believe this was in recognition of her abilities, among them the ability to bring party members together to solve problems and address the Egyptian people's pressing needs. We are all responsible for transforming leadership in the region. Our smart and educated young women need role models and encouragement, and we of the older generation should work harder at this. But I see it also as the responsibility of citizens in powerful states in the world, like the US. You can insist that your leaders support only those leaders in the Arab world and elsewhere who dedicate themselves to developing the capabilities of their own people, and in doing that, involve and engage women. The second uh, action that I see necessary is to give attention to quality in addition to quantity in monitoring indicators so that we can really understand what is happening uh, to women. Our analysis has shown that progress is occurring for women on most of the basic human development indicators in selected Arab countries. Women have reached higher levels of education and are gaining in health every year. But if we use the quality lens, much improvement is still needed. Does the education women receive offer them the skills, knowledge, and outlooks they need to transform their lives? And I ask this particularly for public schools. Do state policies support the caring role of women while offering them opportunities for compatible labor force participation? We, including all of us in this room, need to make sure that foreign aid is spent on issues that are a priority for Arab women and not international donor fashions, since improving the quality of women's lives takes sustained focus and attention to related social, economic, legal, and cultural issues. I am particularly sensitive to education of women. And I think any penny, any money we put in the education of women, the proper quality, empowering education of women, we will see its implications for society. I'm not, uh, of course, talking, I'm, I'm myself in the public health field, and I feel support of public health is very important. Uh, sometimes we talk too much, although it's my field also of reproductive health, and we forget the other aspects of women's, uh, um, women's health. Uh, but I think that in order to cause change in our society, we need transformational education. And we need transformational education for women. Uh, my third action is ending war. This is the most important question to me. How can we transform our region away from war with its instability, uncertainty, death, destruction, and displacement so we can return to quality life? I see two necessary conditions for doing this, and I believe that we have a joint responsibility to bring them about. The first of the necessary conditions relates to the question of justice, justice first and foremost in Palestine. The Palestinian and Arab peoples have a just case in Palestine and have not ceased to struggle and to argue for it since the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. It is not my aim here to open debate on this question but to ask you all to open your minds to the effects of occupation, what is happening in the West Bank and Gaza, and what can be done to recognize the Palestinian rights to a just peace. This, I believe, is a necessary condition to end other conflicts and wars as well. Second is the question of mili military arms 
that are exported at such huge government expenditures to Arab countries. Abbas Zain, this is a colleague of ours, a Lebanese who works in Australia, Abbas Zain describes the silent trade between East and West, and I quote, the military budgets of Syria, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and even Yemen, a country with woeful human and economic development records by any standard, exceed their health expenditures and have been steadily increasing over the last decade. El Zain adds, most of the financial returns generated by this uh, trade flow to Western nations, especially the US. He concludes, if Western governments are genuine about helping to build a better future for the Arab world, they must stop selling our region weapons as if there is no tomorrow. But there is a tomorrow. We believe in it, and so do the many Arab women wondering every day about their tomorrow. But that tomorrow, if it is one of enduring conflict and war, is not only in our hands. We need your engagement in bringing about a just system to govern the globe and an end to production and sale of exports that destroy and kill. Only then can a world of true sisterhood arise and we can share a tomorrow of love and peace. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Barber and I uh, teach at the School of Public Health. Thank you for a magnificent talk. Um, I was very struck by the research uh, study you mentioned where you detail this extraordinarily pervasive um, uh, gynecological suffering amongst the women that you interviewed. And it makes me think that um, education of boys and men is a very critical factor too to improve not only the health and the um, well-being of women, but also the possibility of them playing an active part, uh, as you described, in social and political life. So I wonder if you could say something about how you see um, the role of sort of gender education for boys and men too, and whether you just think that it's... Uh, um, you know, too difficult, and because you didn't really mention it, and so I wonder what you think about that. Because I, in my view, there's so much you can do with girls' education. It's a critical um, area of work, but um, as long as you have very oppressive um, sexual exploitation within the family and the society. Um, the possibility for advancing uh, the agency of girls and women is always going to be delayed. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, yes, I'd like to relate another story. When I was in Egypt, um, we would go to the villages where we were doing the study, and the minute we entered the village, uh, the children would surround us boys and girls and, you know, very excited and things. And I always try to ask them, are you in school, are you in school, are you in school? And many times it was the boys that said, yes, we are in school, yes, we are in school, and the girls were silent. And when I asked, what about you? They said, we were in school, but our parents have now taken us out because we need to help in the chores and in the, and the boys were saying, yes, they're going to get married anyway, so why educate them? So young boys are carrying with them this patriarchal system. And I agree with you uh, that uh, education of men is very important. And when I speak of empowering education, I mean, uh, probably this will be, I mean, if you are in public schools, then you, we have boys and girls. Uh, but, uh, and, and it's important to change the outlooks of men. Uh, but I feel somehow, and it has been my experience, that if women themselves um, uh, get educated and get a good kind of education, then they can fight for their case, okay? But of course, uh, uh, and also, 
uh, women who get educated, I mean, patriarchy is sort of uh, brought about also by women who raise their boys, uh, that they are privileged and that their sisters have to cater for them. And so I feel in a way the education of girls uh, could also produce a different generation of children, boys and girls. So I do agree that education of uh, boys is, uh, is very important, uh, but I somehow feel that uh, targeting the women is a more strategic and efficient. And this will not happen like this. There will be, uh, um, uh, it will work on both sexes. Um, um, but it, it, uh, I think, I feel that uh, uh, this will produce a more change. Uh, it's very difficult uh, it has been very difficult to change men, particularly in lower socioeconomic classes. And uh, I think we have to learn more how to do this uh, in our societies. Thank you very much. My name is Eva Das. Um, we hear somewhat about the idea that progress for women, education for women, is a Western idea, that it's not um, doesn't represent the Islamic world, the, the world that these people live in. How widespread is that problem, and how would you recommend addressing that so as not to further polarize the situation? Uh, I think the problem with Islamic law and Sharia, and those who are more uh, um, cognizant in this can also speak out, is that it is interpreted, is in, is its, in its interpretation, which is under the power of men. And it is interpreted, uh, it could be interpreted that women are not to be educated, but I don't think, and anybody here who's uh, uh, more knowledgeable about Islamic Sharia can, can say that. Uh, people who say it's a Western and it's not uh, in, uh, uh, in congruence with Islam, I think this can be argued, and I don't think this is, uh, this is uh, uh, true. We can see that in Saudi Arabia, education of women is increasing. But the question is, and I think this is what you have in your mind, is what kind of education and how you can change uh, education and change women. I think this is not against uh, Islam. Anybody here who can uh, vouch for this? So, um, uh, Wasma, thank you. Wasma is a, <laughs> is a schoolmate of mine from Ahliya School. Fantastic school, and the best example we have is in our headmistress, who was really superb. And it's her kind of education that probably made me and helped me be here today. Um, first, let me ask, let me say, about the issue of Islam. Islam does not at all uh, stop women from uh, getting educated. As a matter of fact, Islam stresses that every single Muslim, being a man or a woman, uh, have to seek knowledge from uh, babyhood or being in the cradle until they go to the tomb. It should never stop in the life of a Muslim that they will continue to learn. And I uh, was doing some research in China and went to a very remote village, uh, backpacked to it, and uh, they were building a school and developing a high school too, with people coming in with their own, and I saw several times, an uh, old woman or a young uh, man pushing a cart with a cement block to build the school. And on one of those schools, there was written in very large calligraphy, Chinese, Arabic, but in Chinese style, that it is... Uh, this is... Uh, it is incumbent upon, uh, for the Muslims, men and Muslim women, uh, to seek knowledge, even if it was in China, and they were in China, i.e. not only seek knowledge 
in your city, but go travel, go as far as China if you can learn something. So this is taught, I mean, historically, the way education and, and knowledge moved in the Muslim history uh, proves that too, that people went from one place to the other to learn. Uh, and even children were sent at the age of 15, 16, 14, when it was known that they, uh, they have the, cap uh, the capability to learn. Uh, it's men's chauvinistic interpretation that, that creeps in. And we go back to uh, Widat Kortas, our headmistress. There were several times when uh, you know, I'd go and talk with her, and one of those most important times, she said, you have to write the, our generation or the generation that's coming, have to take charge of that situation of why our uh, standards were so uh, limited in education, and the issue is that our contemporary system in the uh, Arab world still reflects what the modernization did in that British colonialism and French uh, created this system that we're still using verbatim, and nothing has changed from 1914 until today. Very little has been changed. And this was to, to present not thinking and leadership and creativity, but to produce uh, a secretariat or uh, people that can carry the bureaucracy. So it is up to the new government systems to look into that and say, do we still need just bureaucratic uh, education or do we need to do research and creative thinking and open it up to whatever is to, to reach to the moon? And we can reach to the moon So because here is Zaha Hadid who was at AUB doing mathematics at the time from Iraq, building some of the most important uh, uh, architectural structures in the world. And she's a woman and an Thank Arab you. woman and a Muslim to that. Thank you, so, Asma. Thank so. you. So it's only a matter of interpretation, and don't let people tell you that education is not uh, supported by Islam. Yes? Huda, Judy Norsegian from Our Bodies Ourselves. Yes, it's been a long I time did. since our dinner yes. in Cairo yes. many years ago. Yeah. And I want to thank you so much for all you've been doing at AUB and everywhere else. I am especially excited about what you said about ending war. Mm -hmm. And I have been in conversation with a number of men's organizations in this country that are trying to bring men into a conversation about ending violence and preventing violence in particular, and to engage men as part of the solution rather than part of the problem, which is so often how men are characterized, and not without good justification, I might point <laughs> out. Um, but that there are some exciting projects, and I know that even UN has men engaged and things like that. I was wondering if, separate from the whole issue of formal education, you can point to some projects where men have been taking a leadership role in trying to end violence against women in small ways, large ways, whatever. And then afterwards, I'll come up and tell you later about the Arabic translation adaptation of Our Bodies Ourselves. I want to give you an update. Uh. Uh, I, I, uh, I think, and what is the actual situation for uh, uh, battling against domestic violence is that it has been very much a women's issue and sometimes supported by men, but not very openly. Uh, in fact, I received this morning an email because a, a petition was circulated among AUB faculty to support uh, the, uh, the adoption of a criminalization law for domestic violence. And it seems in our faculty, except for the dean who is a man, the only signature there is are women. And uh, uh, so the women went up and said, you people in public health, how come you are not supporting this issue, and there is an argument on that. But in terms of war, I think what is important are the issues of foreign policy. Um, I mean, we still believe in this world that we can solve issues or, or bring about what we want through war. And this doesn't, this doesn't really happen. And I think it's the foreign policy that we must address 
and say that uh, it's not possible to think of solutions of war anymore. It's not possible to, uh, to, to go to war. I think the US is saying that, but I think many times it's saying that because of the cost that is involved in war. And uh, maybe they would have liked to go into Syria, and, and, uh, but somehow we must uh, build on these groups and, uh, and create groups that say, no war in this world. Mm. Can I Sorry. just say that the reason some of these men are doing this work is to reach men as young boys through fatherhood programs, working with police departments, working with sports coaches, because they don't see us developing that kind of leadership that will really have the commitment, the political will to mm -hmm. end war. The leadership that we see when we're looking at foreign policy doesn't really appreciate many of the things that they need to in order to make that agenda mm. um, a reality. And, and they are looking obviously ahead to many decades before the fruits of their labor will be seen. And you're in a city, by the way, that has a very remarkable example of that kind of collaboration with the school department, the police department, um, Cambridge Health Alliance, working at the very youngest ages to do the kind of preventive work that very few communities invest in. So I'll tell you about that later yeah, as well. Yeah, this is wonderful work for the future, but what we need need is now. <laughs> yes, uh, Russia. Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, Huda, thank you so much for your talk. I'm actually up here mostly to thank you because I am a Palestinian woman trained in the U.S. for the last 14 years in medicine, public health, OBGYN. Um, and I'm actually returning uh, to Jerusalem to work uh, in the next several months for the rest of my life, I hope. But, I, but I'm up here to thank you because the Reproductive Health Working Group helped give me mentorship, local, regional mentorship, of women who are doing the kinds of work that I want to be doing. And I think a big problem in, in at least Middle East, North Africa, is brain drain. You, you are a woman, you're educated, and then you can't stand the patriarchy, and you can't wait to leave. And then you leave, and you actually are supported and empowered, and you do good work, and then you think, why should I go back? Um, but I think the Reproductive Health Working Group, at least for me so far, has been uh, and the Lancet Public Health, Palestinian Public Health Alliance have been good frameworks for going back and doing good work and remaining sane while you do it. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rasha. I, I want to say that in this lecture, I'll just say this, Liz, I know I've taken. Uh, I, uh, there are many positive things happening in our part of the world. I mean, there are uh, this. I mean, the reproductive health working group, many networks that are being established, many organizations that are working, men's and women's groups. Uh, I chose to to speak for for as much as I could to ordinary women that I have seen uh, who are suffering, and the story is very. Um, pessimistic that I have given, but I wanted to give that story because it should be communicated and we are all responsible, I feel, I believe. And somehow, uh, 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 I, I just, somebody, somebody said, well, you have to give a positive uh, image of what is happening when I was talking about my, uh, my uh, talk. I hope I did not depress you, but the idea is to show and reflect uh, what, uh, what the situation is uh, for many, many women and men in the region. Uh, I know that at the FXB Center, you have shown the movie uh, um, on, on the Syrian women, the five Syrian women, and I've brought with me uh, a copy for the Radcliffe Institute. Uh, this is a very, very telling uh, portrayal of what's happening, and I think we should all we should all see it and uh, reflect on it. Thank you. Um, you didn't need me to ask you to join me in thanking Professor Zurek for what was, I think, an incredibly stimulating and moving lecture. So thank you very, very much.